to finish my series of individual coaches on timeout coaching, we have the rising star of British basketball coaching. Having won at all EBL levels and Bucks levels, head coach for the GB under 20s, and now acting head coach of the Great Britain national team, which he helped qualify to Eurobasket 2022. Please welcome coach Mark Stutel. Coach, great to have you. Um, my last individual guest, um, and, it, and it's someone that I've really been wanted to speak to for, for a long time now. Um, hope you're well. All good, Tony. All good. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Great. Um, let's talk right at the start. Let's just get the, the, the history out of the way. You know, how did you get involved in the game? Obviously, you're from the Northeast. Um, there's a huge um, pedigree of basketball there. Um, so talk about how you, you know, you grew up and, and got involved in basketball and the love of basketball and then how that manifested itself into coaching. So I, I'm disappointed because it must be an accent thing there, Tony, because I'm actually from the Northwest. Um, so I, I actually I actually came up via um, via Jimmy McGinn. Uh, so wow, okay, I didn't well, know you were of all the people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So a lot. Of, it's I was talking with someone a while back, and people didn't realise that. No. Kinda, yeah, you know, I, I had this kind of whole um, yeah whole development there. So. Be, being being kind of from the northwest, you, you play sport. You know, you play football, you play rugby, proper rugby, rugby league, not none of this rugby union nonsense. So I actually played played rugby league as a junior, played football, and just couldn't really kind of get into it. And I was taught, I think I was like six four at the age of fourteen, and and it's amazing kind of how things come full circle. Um, Jason Swain was playing for the Giants. And did some outreach work in in my school, um, which was you know a good forty five minutes from Manchester, um, and and then you know gave a flyer for like a camp. So I, I went to the camp, and there was maybe two or three people there, and and the centre manager walked past and was like, "Oh, I actually my son plays basketball in a uh, and it was Stockport uh, Friday night at the ball hall where they had like the three courts." Absolutely. Coming. Yeah, yes. it was a Friday, Friday night passerelle league. But the team that he played for was in North Wales, which was like probably 35. I'm from Runcorn originally, so it's like 35 minutes the other way. And my mum didn't drive. So literally, I'd gone from getting this flyer, going to a half term camp. And then the next thing is like, you're 6'4, you're coming with us. So I remember like, you know, jumping in the car with this guy who lived, you know, so his son played on the team, etc. So I did that for a year playing for Flincher Flyers. Um, and then uh, there was in the Stockport Ball Hall, the Friday night Passerelle League and just literally just fell in love with it. And I remember picking up and, and what, what it's crazy. I know, you know, your history in schools basketball, but Helsby School is like a national champion in schools basketball. I went to Frodgham, which is about a mile down the road. <laughs> like literally and had no basketball. So like I'm playing with all these people in the area and they're playing in national championships at every level. And I'm just, you know, to my PE teacher, is there any chance I can, you know, it's just completely different. So I did, I did that for a year. And then the second year um, playing at the Stockport league, I just, Jimmy McGinn um, with Ellesmere Port was, was saying, look, you know, we've got a club going on, um, you know, come down. So my last year, like year 11 at school, I was with Jimmy for a year and I just like, I remember, you know, literally taking, you know, my big hold all to school, getting off the bus, running to another bus, traveling like probably an hour and a half on the bus to get to Ellesmere Port. I had to get two or three different buses in the middle of nowhere, literally running into practice. Jimmy knowing that like I couldn't get there before six, but every time I'd get there at six, it just, you know, right. you got, you got a sanction, you got a punishment. And I just, I stayed from six till 10 and then got the last bus home. I did back-to-back -back trainings probably three times a week and just like fell in love with it. And the thing that I love about Jimmy is that he started with a lot of guys on, on his books. You know, he started with, with uh, you know, when it was Eldmere Port out of the uh, Catholic high school, out of the, the youth center. And obviously like, you know, the Leadhams are obviously part of that program on the girls' side, John Simpson on the men's side. There was a couple of players, the Singer brothers, uh, Mark Singer, uh, Paul Singer, who, who were with Jets yeah. for a while. Yeah. So, I was part of that group and in that last that year I kind of you know I accelerated quite a bit and I think I made one of the North of England squads and and then the next year Jimmy actively pushed me to East Durham he was like you need to you need right. to go yeah. um so 
I, I just, J Jimmy was huge for me and so much. He's actually one of the reasons I got into coaching when I was at East Durham, when I kept going back home between the ages of 16 and 18. And just, he would just look out for me and be like, look, I've got a kids camp going on. He came, you know, a little bit of pocket money and can you go and, you know, coach some of the, some of the, the youngsters. And again, one of the, one of the youngsters I ended up coaching as like a seven, eight year old was, was John Gould, who actually I ended up coaching on the England under 16s when right. went with Simon Fisher. So, you know, it was all connected, but yeah. So literally it was, it was two, you know, a year, two years, a year of playing local league at Stockport and then a year playing, um, like juniors with Jimmy and, and then ended up moving up to East Durham at the age of, age of 16. Wow. And at East Durham, um, what, uh, who were your coaches at East Durham? I'm smiling because it's because, uh, because of Bob Martin, you know, Bob Martin yeah. was just, and obviously I listened, listened to, um, I listened to his pod. Um, yeah, just, you know, Bob Martin was just, you know, the most probably impactful, uh, inspirational, um, it's funny, a few of the guys that I played on the team, I played with, uh, like Adam Williams was there, obviously, yeah. who played, you know, you know, you know very well. And, and some, One of know, my favourite, favourite players. Like, it's so under the radar, right? Like, you, oh, you know, really? people, but honestly, yeah. I, and I know these stories, again, probably get embellished, but as a junior, he, 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 you know, I played, he was a year above me. So I, I had one year with him under 18s and we made the final fours that year. Um we played against, uh, we beat Manchester in the semi-final and they were loaded. It was the uh, Harris, Cheryl Ambos, God rest his soul. And it was uh, uh, Callum Jones, uh, Andy Thompson, uh, Metcalf. You know, it, it was real. Yeah, like, it was a big time that. team, yeah. Uh, so we beat them in the semis, which I let them know about. <laughs> and, and we played, But we played um, uh, Steve Vier, Walid, Rob Smith, uh, Jack, Jack Majewski. And, and Ealing in the finals. Um, but, and, and so that was Adam Williams, um, so, some other guys, but Adam was literally, he, you know, games of 50 plus points, you know, he would shoot a free throw right hand, shoot a free throw left hand. He was, he, he was beyond skilled. I think uh, that, I think that some of these players, I mean, and you know, I, I, I do talk to some other people in the future about this, uh, um, but certainly a player like him, could could be really could have been incredible in this open kind of game that we have at this moment. Um, you know, you talk about like the, you know these wing guys who can you know he he was big enough and strong enough again in you know to to, to guard two three and some four you know he could switch yeah, on to yeah, four and not be you know yeah. not not be too disadvantaged in our game and just could score could get up and down could shoot one dribble pull up get to the basket he could he could you know off a he could duck in off a shuffle cut and. He just, yeah, he was, he was, he was really good. So, so I really that first year, and again, Bob, all those guys used to take them, take the mick out of me and say, oh, you know, I was like a, an offspring for Bob because he kind of, he really looked after me. But you know, I, I worked, I worked hard, um, more so on the basketball court than I did with my studies. You know, sure. I was, I was, I would probably in. We used to train nine till eleven and three till five, and you used to access one of those sessions. And I was in there twice a day, every day <laughs> and Bob would just look at me and not say anything, you know. Yeah, and, yeah, I mean, yeah. like in terms of like a technical skills coach, sure. You, you know, I, I I went from I like I say six four six five, stayed that height, and you know I went to on, under sixteens. I was playing back to basket and you know trying to post and just. Not and, and you know that's not a knock on Jimmy. Jimmy was awesome with me, but Bob within the first week was like step out there and shoot the ball, you know, and just just really you know. So Bob Bob was just like beyond impactful for me. Sure. Uh, so yeah, I did I did two years at East Durham, um, and then I went to the states for a year, played in high school for a year, and then came back and actually ended up back at East Durham with the um. With, with the men's team, they were in Division Three. They were working their way up the leagues, um, and it was a partnership with the University of Sunderland. Um, so yeah, did did a, did a few years there, um, which was good playing with uh, Greg Monzaluski. Yeah. Um, cool. So we, we had a we had a good group. It was um, I don't know if did Sam Atta cross over with you when you were with the Eagles, Tony, or not? I no, um, I think Sam came just after with me, after me. I think just after. 
Um, I mean, I remember being at Peter Lee and you guys training there on occasion. Yeah. And I think, I, yeah, you won't remember because, you know, skinny, whatever. But I had, I had one or two sessions with you guys when, when you had the other. No, 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 no. Yeah. I used to, I used to remember coming down there. Um, yeah. You know, that was, uh, those, those were, those were important days for me as well. And I, you know, I used to love coming down to, um, to just do, you know, at that moment I was just coaching as much as I could anyway. So yeah, no, yeah. it's great, great stuff. Yeah. Um, so from there, um, you go to you go to Northumbria. Is that right? No. So I did. Uh, I did two years with East Durham, um, and we it was uh, we we won or we came second in the national league. We played. We had we had a good solid group. Like you know, and it was you know maybe what nineteen year olds you know competing against them. It was Division Three. So, but at that time, you know, I probably didn't know anything else other than I'm I'm competing. I'm playing every day. I'm getting better. And for two years, I played on the um, England Universities team um, for Martin Ford. And again, just I enjoyed it. When, when I came back from the States, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Sure. You know, I, I was kind you know, I, I look back on that experience. And so I enjoyed it. I got my foundation degree. And on the England Universities team, I played with uh, a couple of guys from Plymouth who were at Marjons. Yeah. And I played with a guy from Solent who was at Solent Stars. So I went down and I did my foundation degree, did two years, and then I went down to both of them. Uh, and Plymouth was was, was Gary Stronach, um, and Soul and Stars was a guy called Steve Chant, who was part of part of yeah. there with a guy called Sylvan, who's still around there now. Yeah. And essentially, it was you know, for, in terms of like a British scholarship, you know, we're, we're not talking anything substantial. No. But I kind of I had the decision to go to Soul and, and play Division One at the time and actually play, or go to Plymouth and be told probably going to play d2 train with the and you know people can say but I, I went i went and played for for solent for a year and uh enjoyed that played with like mark jackson and, and a few other guys down there who were right. who were good uh, i got got the chance only on occasion but to work with with jimmy guyman he used to absolutely. do absolutely you yeah. know these friday night sessions um and just you know the infamous shooters club um that he used to kind of have down there so i, I did you know that on occasion um and and then I isn't it, isn't it do you do you look back at this early period of your life now and realize how you were touched by some of these great coaches you know yeah, uh, i mean jimmy you just you're naming jimmy bob jimmy yeah. diamond i mean there's yeah. a number of them you've also that you've just talked about but that's that's an amazing scenario yeah like and at the time do you appreciate that no because you just get caught up in camaraderie and playing and Listen, you know, I always say this. I say this to you know Chris Bunton. Me and him used to have this. Chris Bunton's one of my best friends in the world, and obviously he's had a good season. But I always talk. Me and him used to talk a lot. You know, probably ten years ago about coaching, and I'm always going, mate. You do know that, like, if you're keeping your top nine, ten guys relatively pleased and they respect you, you're good. I said, but you know, like, they're taking the mick out of us a lot of the time. It's what you. It's that camaraderie part of team stuff. Yeah, yeah. And at the time, I was probably just doing that and not realizing it, but. Right. Like I say, and, uh, you know, I wasn't, I, d I don't profess to having a lot with Jimmy Guyman in terms of contact, but I remember, I can remember specifically these Friday night sessions I'd be shooting and he just came up and, and we were playing Saturday. So I was in there just, just literally form shooting. And he just kind of came and gave me like literally three things that were just beyond specific technical. And I'm just like, oh, oh, you know, I can even make this time impactful. At the time, I probably didn't realize that, you know, for me, Bob, Bob and Jimmy were probably, uh, Jimmy McGinn and Bob Martin were probably the two who, um, in terms of like, you know, when you first start coaching, doing what you've, you know, doing what you know, they're probably the two that I, I probably emulated the most, I suppose. But yeah, yeah, we were very fortunate. And when I finished down at Southampton, that's when I came back up to Northumbria and kind of uh, planted roots in, in the Northeast. Right. And at any time at this, you know, these early things, are you, are you doing some community coaching? Are you, you know, is there anything in the mind that, you know, Hey, you know, this coaching could be for me or. Yeah. Well, so, so like I said, there was the, the Jimmy thing where it was at camps and that was my first year at East Durham, my second year at East Durham. Um, Greg Modzelewski wasn't at East Durham at the time. He he was um, in Doncaster and they had like a community program. And right. Bob Martin was only at East Durham Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and he would travel back Fridays. So by a, in the second year, just it, it all kind of fell into place where every Friday, myself and a teammate would drive down with Bob 
and we would coach in schools in Doncaster all day Friday for Greg's program. And then we would go and play, you know, where meet the team on the Saturday because it was the North. So, you know, we could kind of get anywhere. And again, just I look back on it now, it was my teammates' parents. I was just so fortunate to do it. But, you know, I loved it, Tony. But at that time, I was like, it, it was, you know, I'm 17 year old, I'm living away from home. And it was maybe 50 quid for the day. It would set me up for the week ahead, you know? So I was, yeah, sure. and then, and then when I was at, um, uh, in the States, I ended up coaching like assistant on the JV team just for something to do. I came back to uni. I started coaching the second team while I was playing for the first team because I, I just, and, and you know, I kind of had that leadership role just because I was probably mouthy more than anything. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. And then awesome. down in Southampton, I would, I would try and get involved there and coach the university. And then when I came back up to the Northeast, I, I finished my last year at uni. Wasn't sure what I kind of wanted to do. Um, I, I, I was in this transition. Do I want to play? Do I not want to play? Um, and, and literally, I, I've, I was fortunate where I interviewed for a job in, in about the February time at university with the Eagles. And it was a coaching job. And I remember going in to, to, um, to Coach Lane and there was Sam Blake, uh, Susan Hunter, uh, Fab was there. Um, and, and the coaching side, I thought, was okay. And then we're like, right, you've now got the interview side. And they sat me down and talked about sports development, governing bodies, strategies. <laughs> and I'm just going, I haven't got a clue, which, again, probably shows you the value of my sports development degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, or, or maybe what I put into my degree. Uh, but then they said, the coaching side, we've seen something. We might have a job coming up in a few months. Come back to us. So, again, I finished uni in the April, May. And I literally, I, I, you know, so fortunate where um, a, a job came up uh, delivering community basketball in nine primary schools in the East End of Newcastle, maybe a month after graduating. And, be, and so I came back. I was definitely more prepared that time. Came back in. And, and so I literally finished uni and started working. As a, as, a, as a kind of community coach and then started playing for Northumbria whilst Greg was at Northumbria as well and just combining right. those roles. And I also, Sam Blake, strong on me into coaching the under-16s National League team, like their, their academy. And that was the first kind of real coaching as such where I had a, a specific group and, you know, building for competitions, et cetera. Yeah, that's awesome. And so, you know, let's talk a little bit more about this, the whole the Northumbria situation or how, how this all progressed. You know, you're yeah. in you're in this situation, you know, which was at that time starting to grow as, you know, one of the biggest and best clubs in the country. So yeah. there was there was something there. Um, how did it manifest for you? And then how did you move that into your coaching? Yeah, so um, so I did a year in that community role. And then at the back end of that year, the Eagles were launching a partnership with Tyne Metropolitan College, which was kind of the first academy. Um, so that, that the, the person was going to be employed by Tyne Met Direct with Fab's involvement. So Fab is maybe like the figurehead and then the academy coach there. Sure. Um, so, you know, I went for that process. I was appointed. I was chuffed and I had a uh, six good years there at the academy. I just look, you know, absolutely loved it. Reminisced my times at East Durham. So the first year I continued. Am, am I, am I right in thinking just because I know a little bit about the background that the Eagles would practice their men's team would practice in the mornings. Am I right? At the, at the academy. Yeah. Seven to nine. And so I went through a transition of training with them. And then I actually, which I don't, you know, it, I, I'm not saying documented, but I actually assisted one year. I want, I can't remember it was 09 or 10, but I actually, because I was at the academy, um, I got. Yeah, it's I, one of the years, that's, don't forget, that's the year that I beat the Eagles. No, I'm joking. Yeah. I'm joking, yeah. I do remember. Was, <laughs> so was that Sports Central? Yeah. So it was the yeah. first year, first year of Sports Central okay. was the year that I won, uh, won everything. But the so year I before, from, yeah, from year before. Memory, I, I want to say like a one, two, two, three quarter trap. Or maybe some triangle and two, because I remember watching the game. I think yeah. so. So well, I wasn't assisting that year. I remember being in the crowd. Um, <laughs> I think I assisted maybe the year after. Um, it, with with it was Fab, Billy Sprague, myself. So on that team, you know, I I, I I don't I can't remember the year as such, but it was uh, like Reggie Jackson, uh, uh, Charles was there. Um, yeah, so so I was just in and around it and. and uh, the club were good to me because there was a, a job that came up at Manchester with Joe Forber, et cetera. And, and I was um, considered for that job. And I spoke to the the club here about it. And Paul and Fab were like, 
whether you're ready or not, you know, do you want to be an assistant? But at that point, I was like assisting Fab loosely, like second assistant. I was there kind of learning by proxy was probably the role. Um, I was coaching the academy and I was coaching the under 18s. So I was I was kind of doing a lot. Um, so after that year, I kind of said, I just, you know, physically can't do it. Um, and then at the college, they wanted me to start lecturing a little bit on the sports coaching degree. So by default, Greg was still at Northumbria and he uh, offered me a scholarship to cover my PGCE to play. So I kind of said, OK, well, I'll do it for a year or two to, you know, it's got a purpose. So I did it for that first year. And, you know, I wasn't in the shape that I was in previously. I was a bit frustrated. You know, you kind of, your mind saying one thing, whatever. I was, you know, leaving the house at seven in the morning, doing all this stuff, getting back at 11 at night. And then Greg wanted me at seven o'clock shooting the next day. And the guys would be going off to either clap, you know, the, the university guys. And I was, it, it, it was, it was just a lot in my life at that point. And there was about seven, eight games left at the end of that season. And, and uh, Greg had left uh, his position as head of Northumbria. And Paul, had, uh, Paul Blake had said to me, can you, uh, can you oversee it till the end of the year um, as, as player coach? So I instantly just stopped playing and just coached. Right. And we had, uh, we, I think Bradford maybe won the league or they were second or whatever. And so we, I remember we played, we played Chris Meller and Bradford in the playoffs and they, they beat us eight and nine. And I just got a taste for it. And, and yeah. I was doing a lot of the junior stuff. And I was like, well, from a selfish standpoint, I've, I've got the academy. I might be able to have a D2 men's team and a university team. So that summer, we, you know, Paul, the Eagles and Paul ran the university club via a service level agreement. And that summer they offered me the, the, the full time position, which was a, which was part time hours as such evenings sure. and weekends. Um, and that was 11 12, so that was the end of 11 12 and then I started with Northumbria as my first year as coach in, in 2012 um, and just at, loved it at, at this stage just you know even the couple of years before what does the young coach marks what what's your philosophy um, did you have any idea what you were doing were you copying some coaches did you you know what were you doing defensively offensively was there any kind of pattern to anything you were trying to do? I probably at that time I probably couldn't have told you what the word philosophy means if I'm being you know 100 yeah. percent honest. Um, I, I was I was very much my opinion of Northeast basketball was we've got some nice affluent young men, with, and we've got some inner city young men who um, don't know how to compete, and and uh, you know I, I think that's probably. Still, still fair now, still fair. Um, yeah. you know, yeah, I think they just didn't. And, and I was, I felt I was part of a, like, like probably a lot of us do, but as a player, I, I felt like I was tough in terms of being competitive and, and you know, regardless of anything, I, I, you know, I, I would compete. And, and I think they're the traits that maybe Bob and Jimmy had helped instill. So, that, that, you know, a lot of the things that I wanted to do was try and instill this in them. Um, mm. I still, I, pr I probably went all in on individual skills and competing. Okay. I, you know, I, I probably, I probably that, you know, reflect on it now. I, I didn't have like a set framework of an offensive uh, kind of structure as such. Sure. You know, we, we played, we played defense, we played full court, man. We, we kind of, I challenged the guys to guard and, and I tried to help them make them better and, I think, you know, it's made, I still kind of speak with people there who are involved in basketball, not involved in basketball and the like, you know, the discipline and, and I was, I was so proud of that, that because they launched five or six sports academies that year, you yeah. know, football, rugby, et cetera. And I was always proud of, of the reputation that the basketball academy had as people, yes. Yes. you know, and, and that was important. And don't get me wrong, you know, we were competing, we, we you know, competed against Paul Middleton at Loretto, Neil at one of his seven... Runshaw. Well, I can't remember. He's moved. He's moved around yeah. that many, Tony. Yeah, I think. Yeah, no, but he was. He was at Runshaw, and, and I'm sure he was somewhere else as well. Um, was he, was he somewhere else before that? No, actually, he's he's only been at Runshaw and Marsco. Okay. That's, that's, that's crazy. a bit unfair. Yeah. Then I'll let him off. Then okay, I'll let him off. But yeah, no. So he was. Yeah, Runshaw. Um, I can picture the guy they had now to play. A really talented big guy. I can't remember him. Um, so so yeah, we kind of we you know we had we had a real kind of performance uh, environment there you know we had an S&C gym um, so so I, I just I, I couldn't talk 
you know, more highly of, of, of my time there, I suppose, um, from a basketball I, standpoint. I just want to, this is a very left field question. I, I want to put it in here now because we're going to talk more about some even higher level stuff in, in you know, towards the end. Um, I, I was there, you know, um, as you've heard me say numerous times, I think that Paul Blake is the, you know, is one of the great basketball minds and the great owners of the league. He's produced the super, the, the, you know, the, the, the template for a club. Um, he has basketball being played in pretty much all those regions. He has control over it. Why do you think the Northeast still struggles to produce high level players? And I just want to frame that by saying, if you, you, you and a number of people listen to what I say on a number of occasions, mm -hmm. I always feel that, um, the British player doesn't have the ability to see up close professional basketball and the intricacies of the game. And yet this is one place that the fans could, you know, they see a championship winning team every single year, mm -hmm. literally. Um, and why do you feel what's, what's, what do you, what do you think is the, the thing that's stopping not just one or two, but a number of players coming from that area? Yeah, um, and I, I'm, 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 I don't want to offend anybody, and, and I include, I'm going to include myself in this answer. So you know, I'm kind of uh, prefacing it with that. I suppose say you know, take it with a with a with a pinch of salt. I, I don't think that the quality of coaching across the junior pathway is uh, good enough consistently. I I don't. Uh, I think that. There are so many people playing basketball from a participation standpoint, sure. and I think at the the hoops for health program that, that is it is you know it's innovative, it's amazing. That that the, when I said to you like my first program, that's what I was delivering. I said it was Lean East, but essentially it was the same type of same type of. And, and I had a couple of guys that played in primary school that actually went through to under 18s. So that you know that was awesome, but that's just because of the program as such. But I think from that level up until under eight under 18s that there's not enough there's and, and the northeast for a region it, it's very siloed you know and, and and people operate in in silos in their own bubble and that they're not exposed to high enough competition regularly you know if you go you know your experiences in london and you know North London, South London, East London, West London, you know, straight away, the level of competition is completely different. Yes. Whereas I think here, the, the the coaches that probably could make a difference at that level are not coaching at that level. And I, you know, I, I include uh, myself in that. And it, it, it probably happens in the UK a lot. I look around in, in the BBL, in NBL, you know, a, a lot of time, the people who are persistent enough to stay around, who, who you know, or this person is effective at coaching this way, they don't coach juniors anymore. You know, I look, I've mentioned Manchester a little bit before, but you look at a time when Manchester had, you know, Joe coaching, Samit coaching, um, uh, Paul Middleton coaching across the, you know, straight away. There's probably people I'm missing out there. And I, I'm yeah, yeah. There, there are people I'm missing out because I can, you know, but, the, but they had that full pathway of, of a joined up approach, you know, particularly with, with Newcastle. And I think Paul would, would agree to it as well. You know the 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 club model in terms of satellite community clubs is is next level. The participation is incredible. The top end of the club is obviously you know uh, as, as as storied as it is. It, that other bit I think needs some needs some focus. Um, mm. And I would say somewhere like you know Leicester have probably got that right. Yeah, know, yeah. That it's just, whole, yeah. It's just interesting that you know Leicester have got it. I mean, they do have they have even a little bit more history and stuff. But it is it is weird that they have got it right. Um, and although I guess you know Newcastle, you know obviously it is such a football dominated um, area, um, you know cricket, rugby. But you know it's still just yeah. it is a it baffles me that that not one you know kind of I, I, we're not just talking about even a, a GB 16 or 18 we're talking about a real high level professional player um yeah. you know where 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 is where is that person at this moment so i, I don't know is the answer and i, and I agree with you and, and you know the the comment on football and and, and uh, rugby yeah but that's a, you know that's the same anywhere it is and, and like i say you know i'm not just all this because i'm i'm part of it as well because 
you know, I have the opportunity to coach juniors, but I kind of did that for a short time and then sure. progressed on. So is, is that a, a wider thing where, um, you know, regards what people say, there's, there's no monetary value attached to that. And, and people, you know, as they move through their own lives and they have to, um, you know, mortgages and, 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 you know, life moves on, you have to, yeah, you know, you have to have a monetary value to what you're providing. And at some point, the 16s and the 18s and the 14s it is not providing that. So, I think, but ultimately, to some, I would say coaching and competition. I think they're the two biggest elements of it. Great but, stuff. Yeah. Um, let's, um, like you've just, just alluded to, um, you're in Northumbria now. Um, an incredible, what I, what I always look at where, where you start to see the best basketball being played, just a great basketball environment, sports central, like you say, a brand new facility, um, the university are all in on high level sport. Um, like you said, S and C, um, competition. So now, you know, talk about that journey, um, and, and how you transformed that situation into a, to a national powerhouse. Yeah, I, I mean, you said it there, and, and um, as it, you know, you're triggering kind of memories with me, and and I I, I would start practice at times, and you know, if the mood was a little bit light or whatever, I'd just be like, can you just look around and look where we are? We're in the UK, we've got this, you know, and at times we'd have the whole thing to ourselves. Sure. Uh, you know, we've got a scoreboard, we're, you know, sprung foot. We're just, we 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 had it positive, you know, we had a good situation, and I would set, I would I would try and because I played for Northumbria when I was playing at Coach Lane and it's the hardest floor. <laughs> so I kind of saw, I saw, and yeah, you know, you had some practices up there too. So yeah, I mean, I guess my first year I, I was, I was fortunate where um, I got recruitment, right. And, 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 you know, if I'm being a hundred percent honest, my first year was I recruited a hell of a team and, and talent wins. And, and sure. you know, I think I was, I had a good blend of, I had two or three of the academy players that were had been England under 16s, under 18s. I had a couple of the Eagles fringe guys like uh, Jamie Glenn, etc., who yeah. who who was playing. Uh, I had a senior guy in Simon Stewart who came up to do his PGCA, who played. You know, he was at Worcester with PJ, and then he he uh, he played D1 at Coventry for a little bit, and we were Division Two at the time. I had a few guys that I'd played with the previous year who were returning. Um, and I managed to pick up a US guy who was studying at Durham, which was, you know, a competitor, but they had like seven US guys and he, he, could, he didn't fall into their, um, to their plans. And it turns out he was like a, you know, a B2, he got to the final fours. I mean, it, we won the national final that year and Simon Stewart had 30 and 13 in the final and didn't get the MVP because the American had 18, 12 and 10, you know, like it, so... I get like, did I do a good job? Yeah, th you know, I thought it was okay, but I, I recruited well and we had, a, you know, and it, it made it easy in terms of, of, of that year. But I think what was good is the things that I believed in, in terms of, you know, a culture and environment, a, you know, how we practice, how we maximize every minute, everything has a purpose. I, I really, even though I'd been at the academy, I'd had a lot of hours on the floor getting reps in where I thought I was able to, Bring that so across. where 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 were you were you asking any other coaches for advice on you know practice planning you know uh, planning for the season um or or was this just something that you were picking up you know you picked up off of um the, the places that you had been yeah I, th I think that side of it i did I, I well i have developed for sure in terms of what i would class as i don't know like polishing you know what you do as a coach you know I'd, i would always be planned except but sometimes it'd be on a, a, my notepad that I'd, i've scribbled down and sure you know as opposed to right i've got my plan what's my next part what's the specific purpose for this next 15 minutes what's a non-negotiable that we're getting out of you know at that moment in time i probably no, not probably i definitely wasn't as effective uh, in that um i was fortunate where I crossed over with with Fab. If we if we were six to eight, Fab was eight to ten. If we were eight to ten, Fab was six to eight. You know, on the same court. So you know, you can't you can't knock that. Um, there was other elements where you know I was part of that Horizons program. So I had feedback from yourself. I had feedback from John Collins. That you know I, I can remember the specific feedback to this day. Um, so you. You, you, at uh, this moment, so not only are you at Northumbria, you're actually first, that's the first access to the GB 
well, uh, yeah, the GB pathway. I'm not sure if it was GB at that time. Was it, was it England? GB? It, it, it was, was England. England. Yeah. yeah, it was England at England. that time. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that that um, that followed from um, when when I was at Tynemet before at Northumbria. Uh, I actually played for Simon Fisher. Um, I, I didn't make the final 16s. I, I think I was in the last squad. And I just reached out to Simon and said, look, you know, I'm, I'm into coach. I've got a full-time position. And he's like, you know what? Not, nobody does this. Like, so he said, if you can fund yourself, you can be involved as much as you want. And it was Simon Fisher. It was Carl Brown. And it was uh, Sean Reed from East London. Sure. Um, and I, so I was like a volunteer assistant on the 93s group. Went to selection camp in the winter. Went to Belgium with them at Christmas went to a camp in February and I went to Portugal and like I paid, paid myself to go the full. Yeah. I don't, sorry. I just, I just want to stop you, just stop you very quickly. Um, it's probably the first time this has come up um, fully in the way that you've done it, but it's really important. I think to make this point that a number of as coaches and it all comes even down to me, older Dave Titmus, uh, coach Dunn in all of these, you know, there is a time where when you really want to be good um, or you want to gain some more knowledge that unfortunately you're going to have to, you know, part with some, some, some of your own money because you've got to, it's almost an investment in yourself. Um, I used to sometimes get frustrated. I remember um, I also did exactly the same. I did it with some of the world student games um, programs. You know, uh, I did it with some of the England programs as well. Um, when I was a very young coach um, that I felt it was really important for me just to, even if I'm there standing, you know, passing the ball in drills um, that I could see how the practices were developed or people were teaching something. And I think that's really a, such an important point. And, and to that, you know, again, you know, you look back, Simon was so good with me in that, in terms of pulling a program together and he still reaches out all the time now. And, and you know, like I do with him when I see whatever he's doing, um, but he, he, I thought, look, I'm going to observe. And next thing you know, he's got me in a drill passing. And then at the next camp, he's got me leading 10 minutes with the bigs. And then, you, you know, it was that. And it, it was Greg Mods who said it to me. You know, Greg Mods said to me, you've got to get outside the Northeast. You've got to go and see. And, and I was like, okay, that's, you know, that's resonated with me. Let, let's go. And I re honestly, I, know, I remember Boxing Day. I had a banger of a car, Tony. Honestly, if it passed its MOT, it'd be lucky. And I drove Newcastle to, um, to Dover, you know, and, and just again I'm snowing you know I look back at it now and I think on the way that I took Ross Wilson with me and I think I picked Devon Van Oostrom up and the same on the way back and just you know but like having that tournament in Belgium I'm, I'm there with KB and I'm there with with Simon and just the experience you know I think Simon doesn't get enough credit for how he organized programs at that level you know how he organized the national team program and understood certain things and um so, so that was my first one. And then after that, it, it became the, the Horizons program after that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. And so um, just, you know, just get through the Northumbria. Okay, yeah. You know, you, you know, now you're, you know, you're starting to develop. You're, you, you know, you get part out of Division 2. You're in Division 1. Yeah. You're starting to compete at the highest levels of Bucks. Um, yeah. So just talk that, that process through. And from a coaching standpoint, because I was talking about before, again, I, I had a, a, a probably a rude awakening um, because, yeah, and again, it, you know, I think, I don't think everyone, you know, talks about honesty, et cetera. And, and I think it's important to do that. But, you know, I had, I had a year where in Division Two, I think we were 20 and two. It was us and uh, Hemel, which was Dave Titmus, who, by the way, is somebody competing against, would always talk to me. And I always appreciated him offering advice. He still emails now, you know, which is which is which is really good. So so we got promoted. The next year we finished third, I believe, and um, Reading won the league. And uh, Summit was was that was the year that he had Luke, um, and that was he, that was the best coaching job. Uh, I felt embarrassed because I was awarded Coach of the Year that year, and I was. I think that's maybe because Summit annoyed more people than I did, sure. <laughs> you, you know. I think, but he 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 was awesome. And then I think Bristol maybe finished second with Andreas, ourselves. You know, Matt Newby was in the league with Leeds. It, it was a really competitive league. And um, we, lost in the, we lost in the final four to Worthing on uh, the goal interference call. Um, so I'd, I'd had two years where 
you know, it was accelerated. And in my own head, I was like, yeah, I've, I've got this nailed. You, you know, genuinely a kind of like, you know, I thought, I thought, yeah, it's fine. You know, I can coach anyone. I can challenge anyone. I can get after anyone. But, and then the next year, like, you know, university basketball, we had a complete rebuild. You know, most people had finished the programs and I had a new group and on paper I'd recruited a really talented group. And this is a knock on me and not on, on them. No. And I just, I could, it just didn't work. <laughs> yeah. I know that sounds simple. I just, I had ideas. I, I recruited like three or four players who were all three fours. And in my mind, I was like, I'm going to run loads of flex type stuff and always attack the mismatch. And we can post this person as a three and we've got shooting and we've got space, you know, for two years, I'd emphasize defense probably 85% of the time. Maybe that's because I wasn't as confident teaching offense at that point in my sure. life. Sure, you know, yeah. You know, and but at that point, then that we couldn't guard, like we couldn't, and then I'm and then I'm exposed because I'm trying to get us to be effective offensively. So it, you know, I learned I learned so much that yeah, and I had a real. They, they were such a good group of people. They were talented in their own right. The blend didn't work, and it made me. You know, I always I, I I'm, I've spoken about this, but Chris Meller, you know, Chris Meller is again. He's been around some amazing coaches himself, and he's experienced, and he's competing in the league with me. And we're, we're hovering at the bottom of the table after the previous two years. And he's picking up the phone twice a week, you know, how Matt Shaw, you know, li literally I'm taught, you know, and, and that kind of um, objectivity for me was, was, was huge. Um, but there was, there's probably two or three guys on that group who stayed the course with me when we won the league. Uh, and so that, that was kind of a bit of a, a bit of a, a journey that, that, you know, me and some of the Tom Devitt, et cetera, we look back on now. So I learned probably more that year, Tony, that was my third year in national league than I did in the previous two. Um, and it really allowed me to kind of, I guess, evaluate and say, you know, what's important. How do you, how do we build effectively? How can you change my management stat? You know, maybe not bark at everybody all the time it doesn't work maybe then tweak it a little bit and, and um, see how we can get on that way yeah um at the same time you know you're doing you um, believe you're in in the gb pathway also you, when did you do the fecc course yeah so that was um i actually i started so the the year that we lost in the final four with the buzzer the basket interference that was in the the april I go that summer to the Ukraine and on the second day, I'm 70 coaches around Europe and Richard Stokes is at the front delivering the first part of the clinic. And he's like, let's talk about some topical things that we've been discussing first clip. And I'm just like, Oh, like, so he has, he has the, 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 you know, the, the, the gold send up there. So that was 2013 to 2015. Um, did, so that you, did, did that, um, because you know, um, nothing, uh, no, I don't think I've heard any coach, uh, uh, say a bad thing about the course. As a matter of fact, everyone said that it's changed their whole mindset. Um, talk just quickly about that course and who, who were the most, uh, influential people that you, that you, that you listened to and that yeah. you changed some of your views on coaching. Yanis Dravic, um, and I've probably butchered his surname, but he, uh, amazing, you know, coached, Yugoslavia, you know, Coach Draws and Petrovic, et cetera, and just the best teacher of the game as a clinician, you know, it, it, um, just he, he was awesome. Pablo Lasso was was in, incredible. Um, Henrik Dietman or Detman, and Detman. you know, yeah, uh, Detman, he was awesome. I, I thought Chris Fleming was on a different level. Um, That's why he's in the NBA. Exactly. <laughs> you know, he just... And, and you know somebody who can just hold hold a group, hold a room, and his his time and response. You know, yeah, he was. Maybe he's uh, the reason why Utah are uh, uh, where they are at this could moment. Be. Yeah, could <laughs> be from his from his. Um, he's his, his he's he, through German, you know, ascent through through German basketball. Yeah, he's 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 got that Chris Finch, Nick Nurse about him. Um, he was able. I mean, look, no offense to Bamberg, although. Quick shout out to Johan, Chris's uh, ex assistant, who's there now, um, that hopefully will push them back up. But they've never been the same club since Chris left. Yeah. Um, and they've had big time coaches there. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really, I mean, I've, I've always been super impressed with, with everything he's done. Yeah. Was there something that changed your view either tactically or philosophically from that course? Pro probably, probably more so. Um more so tactically i remember um again you just you get so it was myself and steve bucknell were the the 
English British representatives. Sure. Um, and um, you know, like I say, sixty odd coaches. And you obviously just by default you try and speak to everybody. But the best part of it for me was the the informal part. The, the clinics were great, yeah. but but the the informal part. So uh, there was a, a coach Ricardo, and I'm not going to butcher his surname because he'll hammer me. Who, who's the head coach of the Portuguese women's team? And in terms of technical detail on guarding screen and roll, and I'm, I'm talking about, you know, we've been in clinics all day, 10 hours, heads battered, got an assessment that I know I have to write that night and me and him in, in the hotel bar, you know, like talking and, and he stood up, you know, showing me different screen and roll concepts. And there was a, a Latvian guy, uh, Raimonds, and there was another Latvian guy called R2. So we've both done really good things with the Latvian national team at different levels. So again, just like, talking about footwork how you teach guards different you know that that side of it i've still got like notes you know that, that i had from three years um so it, it was the informal side of it for me that was probably the most impactful um and i'm not like the clinician you know like uh chris fleming for example we had these little breakout groups where we'd have times throughout the week you'd sit in groups of 10 or 12 um and, you know, being able to get some knowledge there, I think, you know, probably not being too cynical, but some coaches probably found that as an opportunity to like share their own knowledge and, mm. and try and impress Chris Fleming, as opposed to I'm sat there going, can we let this person talk because I'm trying yeah. to be a sponge and get, get as much from them as we can. But yeah, it was it, in terms of a program, Tony, it was, it was, and again, I've been so fortunate that that was, that happened at, at, at you know, relatively early part in, in kind of my development. Just going back to the Northumbria situation, and you can just quickly just uh, detail that in, you know, the successes and stuff. Um, do you think that um, the fact that you were on the floor, not, you know, almost two times a day, um, that was accelerating you as a coach? I mean, I, I wouldn't be mistaken, but you, you might have been coaching more than, you know, say, even say, 70% of the BBL coaches at that time. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, now it's maybe a little bit different in the last, say, four or five years. Yeah. Uh, most of those teams now are fully full-time in inverted commas. I still don't believe they're full-time like they are in Europe. But, um, yeah. they, you know, that's a, that, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, you can't replicate you can't replicate that experience. And, and, I, and I, I was, you know, you know, sometimes at time I'd have two a days or one a days, but even if I had one a day, you know, like I had, I had a big guy, uh, Theo Turner, who, who picked the ball up late, who ended up going to Seattle, like six eleven. he played in the BBL yeah, a little yeah. bit. And yeah. I was like, I'm getting him in the, you know, I've got 45 minutes at lunch. We're getting him in and we're hook shot in and we're footwork, you know? So I was trying to do as much as, as much as I could. So, so absolutely. And I'd literally leave time met, whiz down the coast road, straight into Northumbria, uh, and me and Fab would always talk about it. You know, Fab would always be a master at planning sessions with like eight, 10, 12. And sometimes I'd get there and I'd have 17. And me, so me and him used to joke about it a little bit. Like if you had more than eight, sometimes you'd be like, oh, and I, if I had yeah, that. Yeah. So, but, it, but you're right. You know, it's those little things where I've planned this drill. I've planned the rotation in the drill with this, with this purpose. I want to get this out of it. And you get there and then the drill can't operate and you've still got to get the same purpose. So you've got to tweak it on the fly. So absolutely like that, that kind of accelerated it, you know, accelerated, I guess, I guess, you know, my, my development. And I was super aware of how fortunate I was, you know, and I made like, I, you know, oh, I mean, I, I don't, I don't yeah. think you should be, I don't think you should be, you know, um, in that theory. I mean, yeah, you can say you're fortunate, um, but, you know, at the same time, that's what we strive for, you know, in this country is to have that ability like now, like, uh, you know, say Ian, for example, at the Eagles or Rob at Leicester. You know, I told Rob um, the moment that he got the arena at Leicester, he might as well start you know, printing national championships and playoff championships because, it, yeah. you know, they were such a well-run organization um, yeah. that having their own facility was just like, you know, this is unfair almost, you know, and yeah. now Newcastle, it shows that, you know, having your own facility, what it can actually do for you. So, yeah, that's uh, a, yeah. so very quickly, let's get past Northumbria. Yeah. So, yeah, so, 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 yeah, I said, I mean, again, I've probably missed out some groups, etc. but it, it came to a culmination, Tony, 2016, 2017, we won the, we won the national league. We won the national cup. Uh, we battled against Matt Guyman for a few years, seeing them in some different finals. And, and I just, it, it, it was just utter elation because the group I'd had for a few years, 
Uh, I'd had two or three guys who developed in Newcastle with me as youngsters. A few older guys returned. I got one import who's who was just on a on a different level as a person. Um, so just you know beyond elated, and we had a couple of success in books, etc. And then the following year, you, you know, we were still competing, but at the end of that year is when the university, not the basketball program, had a change in like like most things in England, you know, lead situation, etc. I don't know why I pointed down the road, they're not there, but lead, you yeah. know, these different situations and changing in leadership at the at the vice chancellor level, and just we want to change our approach to sport and kind of rip the plaster off and said we're we're now books only, so. Yeah, I actually, um, I left uh, last year, you know, I just, the direction of the program wasn't what I wanted to be doing. So I wanted to see out some guys that I'd recruited. Uh, so I kind of had a couple of years that I didn't particularly enjoy. And that's not a knock on the players. I just, the program just didn't feel the same. And then, and then, yeah, unfortunately, just, just kind of ha- ha- felt like I had to step down from it. Um I'm going to ask this question now. Uh, so it's the only kind of semi-controversial question of the day. Um, in that period where you were still developing and you were, st- but you were winning, um, how much did you were you thinking and wanting to coach in the BBL or Absolutely. in a professional yeah. situation? And 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 what was the reasons that held you back from from doing that? So at the at the end of this. 16 17 season uh, 16 17. Yeah, at the end of the 16 17 season um i uh, yeah there, there was a potential opportunity that i explored um um if i'm being you know honest i, I felt that i'd got to a point with that opportunity uh, and then and then it wasn't there any longer um through through no fault of my own so so I, you know with that one i'm not sure i i had a decision to make in the end mm. um yeah, I think I think like all of us, you know, you kind of you you you're aspirational and you put you put you know work in and and um, I guess you know my objective criticism of the BBL is probably twofold, where um, there's not enough clubs and and there's a lot of tenured coaches, and I think uh, you know I, I'm not trying to promote a a, a high turnover for, for a profession, but you know I, I look around and, and other people are experienced and if it's a job that's based on success, how do you measure that success? So, you know, if there was more clubs and more opportunities and more jobs, fine. But if not, then where are the next people coming from? Mm-hmm. And who, how do you, I mean, I look at Rob and and Rob has proved the worth in coaching, you know, and, and I, I don't know Rob on a personal level, but he's somebody from a distance who I, you know, kind of respect and say, look at what, and you can see the impact of coaching. You can see the impact of, of, of what he's done and he deserves everything. So, you know, I'm saying tenured coaches, I, 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 that's a blanket statement because mm. I'm not alluding to somebody like that, no. but you know, how do you measure success? Well, at, at the professional level, is it winning and losing? Mm. And then if, it, if it's not winning and losing, so you're not winning consistently, is it then developing players? So if that's the case, where where are those? So I just. Well, uh, Ed, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll stop you there. Um, to me, I I don't know. I have this you know argument in my master's um, course. There are only two outcomes in in reality in in coaching. If you can add a third, if you want to, one is winning. Okay, two is developing the athlete to his potential, and three, if you really want to say, is developing the athlete as a person. That's, there's, there, there aren't any really any more of those outcomes unless you are in the business of showmanship and you, you're putting them people on, uh, on, the, on the seats, even if you're not winning. But, you know, that's, a, that's to me, is a, it's just putting it in as, as, as simple as possible. So you're right. If you don't win, if you don't produce players or you don't produce the players that are good people, I'm not sure what that actually equals. But, yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, that's... Yeah, I guess that's my observation from here. So, yeah, that I mean, absolutely, I'm, you know, not not shy in saying that those aspirations uh, were, were 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 I don't know were, were there fully at that time. They're probably still there on some level now. You know, I think you probably have that professional challenge to say, you know, could you be effective in that you know environment? That's probably still there at some level. So, yeah, I mean, who knows? You've got to kind of control what you can control and, and continue sure. just to 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 work. Um, I think, you know, the other thing, Tony, you know, I listen to so many different people who have so many different, they have a lot of rich stories to say, and you can get a lot of information from different coaches who've, who've had different paths. 
you know, the thing that I absolutely rest easy at night is I, I'm a dad first and foremost, and that that 100 is, is 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 my priority. And, and yeah. he's he's in Newcastle, so there has to be something in my life where where you, you know it, it's workable around around my son. So sure. that's something that, that I have to consider. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. It's great. Let's talk um, about very quickly about the GB pathway and how you got involved and the steps you took the people you worked with along the way and how you've ended up in this position at this moment. Yeah. I'm conscious. So, I, so I've, I've mentioned the Simon stuff. I did the new horizons program, uh, which was, uh, I think a Warwick initiative, I think, which Absolutely. I know you were involved yeah. in as, as, as yeah. the mentor coach, which was uh, myself, uh, Samit, Matt Newby and Simon, I believe. Yeah. Uh, um, which, which, you know, was a really positive program for me. You know, it gave us some maybe more autonomy from what I'd had from the previous experience with the 16s. Um, so, I, you know, I enjoyed that being around other coaches. And again, I remember us sitting in a, in a room in Bradford, you know, in the hall, you know, talking there. I remember some of the specific feedback. I did a transition defensive session. I remember some of the feedback from yourself. John Collins came to Newcastle and followed that program on when you had, had a, I think, a professional opportunity and, and, John gave me some feedback there. You know, I think it was a screening session that, you, you know, so, so those things were really impactful to be in that environment. I was then, um, I was the, the next opportunity that I had was when Doug Leishner was appointed the under 20s head coach. Yeah. And um, I applied for an assistance position and uh, was interviewed and offered the position. And, and then after I was offered it, I was, um, I was told, um, I couldn't make it to a commitment that I'd already committed to that before the interview. And I was like, I told it, I wouldn't have put myself forward. So he, he appointed, uh, it was two, it was myself and James Veer and Doug. And so then I, I was gutted that I passed up on this opportunity. I'm like working with this coach on the under twenties, you know, it was just after, you know, 2012, et cetera. So, you know, there's that feel around the program. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think that there was a situation where Doug, wanted to make a change amongst the staff so then he rang me back after that time period right. and said look we're actually like three weeks out now I know you've missed three weeks but you said you're about are you available now so I just literally the next day I was there which I was again you know kind of fortunate so we we had a um we were in Romania and it was the 93s that I'd been with when they were under 16s so it was Devon Joe Hart, uh, Zach Wells, Raf Thomas Edwards, Raul Graham. Um, it, you know, it, it were a lot of the guys there um, that I'd known previously. And, and we came second. Uh, we we uh, lost to Poland uh, in the final, who would be in the group stages. And I just, I loved it. You know, Doug gave me specific responsibility. It was probably my first time using Game Breaker, being in that environment. Um, so, so I really, Doug had said to me, and it showed me the, uh, yeah, he showed me the report. He, he wanted to keep the staff together for the following year in Division A, um, and uh, I think you know uh, Vladan had some other ideas, um, and, and he, he encouraged me to be with the under 18s, um, which I was I was disappointed about. Uh, sure. You know, you kind of you felt there was some guys returning from that group. You know, working with the same staff at least for two years. Um, and then I, I, throughout that year, I actually accepted a full-time lecturing position at a different institution. So it, my start date clashed with the Mannheim tournament in April. And, and the, the, my, my new employers were like, the, you know, you're starting. I spoke to Vlad and he said, no, we can't. And I said, yeah, that's probably right because I don't want to do the program a disservice. And I was told then, if I'm out, I'm out. That's what, you know, that, so 2014, I was... I'd, in my mind, that was me done with with national teams, um, and it wasn't until Mark Clark was back involved, uh, who I had no prior relationship with or anything. I, I felt refreshed that it, you know I was able to go for a fair and transparent process and was kind of judged on, you know, I guess previous body of work or, or, sure. or, or that process itself. So, um, yeah, so it, I really positive up until then, and then I was I was a bit disgruntled for a few years to say yeah that. just real quickly to doug um a yeah. lot of uh, positive i mean this is almost like the jesse sergeant type scenario where uh, doug's name always comes up you know with a with a number of coaches who they feel had he played quite a big role in 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 their development you know yeah. talk what, what was some of the things you took from him 
Doug, uh, I mean, something that I just not say. You, I mean, again, I know you said you talk about Doug making players be ten foot tall. Honestly, he 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 just had instilled unrivaled kind of confidence where it was like it doesn't matter who's in front of us, you know. And that was he was very um, consistent with his approach, as in, i.e., we're doing the same drills every day. Shell build. I remember him seeing it now with charges in it. I'm picturing Jordan Spencer taking a charge off Devon every day and getting points for it. Um, we, we went through the same processes. We had a lot of sets. It was very set-based, sure. um, which for me at that point, I hadn't seen that amount of sets in that short space of time. So that opened my eye. Doug scripted minutes. So he was the first person wow. who, who shot, you know, which for me was... And, you know, there was some variance on it, i.e. fouls, et cetera, but he scripted minutes. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, for it, Nick Lewis was on that team who, who he was part of that kind of rotation. And he just excelled in that role because he knew when he was coming in, what his job was. He, so he kind of defined roles really well. Um, defensively, I thought, kept it, kept it really solid and rolled the dice with a 1-3-1, which at that time you know, was, it wasn't seen as much, particularly in that tournament, you know, yeah, in, yeah, in, yeah. I mean, it was Division B, but there wasn't, so So he, he threw a 1-3-1 out there, which I thought was, and the way he coached it, um, it was it was Michigan 1-3-1, so he shared that with me. So there was there was a lot of learning there, probably management, coaching, people side, sure. tactical side, and, and then holistic across the program, I think. Right. And then... Mark gives you the opportunity and just to describe that whole kind of like this, this last yeah. kind of chapter there. So I guess Mark's overview was, was, you know, let's have a bank of coaches. And if somebody says, look, I've done this amount of years straight and I need a summer off for, I don't know, the birth of a child, or I've got something, you're not going to be like blacklisted and you can't come back in. So, so the job was out. I applied for the job. Um, it, you know, it was a strange one, obviously, with with uh, Lloyd and Josh, Josh Merrington and Lloyd were the assistants, where I assumed one of them might go for it. But obviously, Lloyd was involved with seniors and, your, and, your, and yourself. So I think it was about keeping that consistency. And because a little bit of a crossover with the seniors, he couldn't be the head coach. So he, he so I applied for the head coach. I was uh, I was appointed. I was, you know, literally just elated beyond belief. Um, had a four week window. Um I guess budget restrictions, etc. Preparation, you know, we played uh, Poland twice, who were a Division B side at the time. At the time, we played Germany in Germany two days before the tournament, and then and then we played Division A, and it's just, you know, it just in, incredible. So, I, I, yeah, but that that experience is a learning experience. You know, being with Josh is one of my best friends in the world. Josh assisted me at Northumbria. I, you know, I'd helped him we'd helped each other, should I say. I took more from him probably than he took from me. Um, so having Josh there, Lloyd is just the, you know, an incredible basketball mind in the UK. His wealth of knowledge is is off the charts. His ability to, um, I don't know, emotionally manage situations and stay cool and calm and composed and, and challenge in the right way. Uh, so I just, I, I can't, I had a support staff like Tom Cresswell, you know, people always talk about coaches, but really having that first-hand experience of being a decision maker for a program, managing the load, like, you know, working uh, from, from a, a physiological standpoint and understanding that balance. Tom Cresswell is a genius. He, you know, the governing body should be absolutely knock. Honestly, he is so impactful at what he does. Um, so, so managing that, that, that kind of process on the whole, beating Greece, staying up, and, and beating the Ukraine was just, it was, you know, it was amazing. You know, Carl Wheatle, you know, being able to share that journey with him, you know, I didn't really have any prior knowledge or relationship with him, uh, but, you know, that was the end of his under 20. So, yeah, I was, it, it, I can't talk, you know, how, again, I, I wish that I had a second year at it. I kind of sure, wanted, another, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I felt that my learning from the first year could have, could have transpired into the second year, but, um, but yeah, re really, really positive, Tony. And then, you know, I mean, without getting into, you know, fully the, 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 the whole kind of scenario of the politics and stuff, how, how have you ended up now, you know, in this position, you know, and, and this, this incredible last two windows that you've had um, with the men's team? Yeah. So that was the, so that was summer 2018 with the 20s. Uh, 
FIBA then goes into the November window. Um, so a few months after, um, and I get a phone call off uh, Mark Clark, who's obviously like the performance director and um, says that Haman Gabriel is, is not able to, to be there because of his club commitments, because they didn't want to release him. And I'm, I'm looking for a, another body. And I guess in terms of the pathway, you know, I was the, technically an under 20s coach. It was probably a natural progression. Um, so again, just, you know, it was with Al, Alberto Lorenzo, uh, who, who I know you'd worked with. So um, I didn't know, Al, I didn't speak to Alberto previously. I kind of had the phone call from Mark, had a bit of message with Lloyd and, and kind of showed up. And uh, I got there on day one and, uh, you know, I'm trying to meet the guys. I'm trying to be, you know, as if I, I'm comfortable in that environment, but there's probably a little bit the first time you're in that environment, you're like, oh. you know, there's a lot going on here. I, I remember, you know, see it. Like, I, I think it's the first time I'd seen Andrew Lawrence on the floor. And I remember he made a play live in person. I was like, holy shit. You know, like, just <laughs> yeah. like, you know, you just have these like, yeah, like yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, Gabe, I'm like, G Gabe Olaseni, is that is that actually the definition of a professional player because I'd yeah. seen it and heard it, but that's actually the definition of a, of a, of a pro. So uh, Alberto dropped on the Cyprus scout with me um, on day one, you know, guided it. I worked with Lloyd a little bit um, and, and, and I just, yeah, I just, you know, literally the most amazing experience that, that uh, you know, probably, probably could have had. Um, obviously we, we lost to Austria. That was, you know, Landersberg's 50 point game or whatever, just, oh which triggered the, the next cycle of events when you look back on it. Um, yeah. so, so we lost to them on the home game, traveled to Cyprus. The mood in the group was, was tough. It was low. And as we're on the, we had the most horrendous travel day and we're on the bus in, in Cyprus for our, like we were going to go to the hotel. Alberto diverts the bus and he just turns to me and he says, you've got shooting to start off with, get these guys going. And you know what the guys are like, they're just, that, that, you know, there's a carryover from the, the, the game. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Had no food, the travels are, it's like a nine hour day. So there was just these little things where I look back on it and like these experiences that, yeah, were amazing. So I was an assistant for uh, two windows with Alberto. And then the third window, I was an assistant with Nate. Um, and then, and then more recently, uh, you know, Nate wasn't able to, to attend the last three windows. Um, so I kind of uh, acted up as, as head coach for those three. So these, these three windows, I mean, you know, it, it, it is no one can, this is not like, uh, um, you know, oh, you're, you're taking something, you know, in recreational league and stuff, you know, you're taking the Great Britain team um, in the pinnacle competition. Um, we Have you been able to, you know, put your own kind of philosophy into that? I mean, obviously you carried over some of the sets. I mean, even I carry over sets, you know, when you come in from, you know, taking over from a coach. Um, have you been able to imprint some of your things and, you know, how have you got the group um, playing, you know, so together and then obviously with some of these big wins? So, yeah, it's, it's probably very nuanced, as, as, as you know, in terms of, you know, some of the finer detail. Um, less is more in those situations. And, and even my first window, which we had the camp in, in Montenegro, to the last window, I, I put. I tried to put too much in in the first window. Right. I, I did. I tried to put too much in, and, and you know, probably a lot of transition, quick hitter actions that you think, oh, you know, they may be good for us, and and then you get into the game, and, and you don't. You probably need, you know, to do two or three things really well. So sure. transition, half court, whatever it may be, as opposed to four or five things at each phase of the game. So. I knew that I went in with that mindset and yet I still didn't do it. I still right. I put maybe a little bit, a little bit too much in. Yeah. Um, and it, it's amazing just that, you know, the lens of seeing it through the head coach seat is different from the assistant. It completely is. Absolutely. And you're just in this constant, well, what if they do this? Well, what if we see that? Have we covered this? Have we discussed that? I need to talk about this for two minutes because I've, re I've really got three practice days you know, really, and that's one where I can actually get after it for 20 minutes, and then the other two, it's it's, it's probably moderate intensity. Absolutely, yeah, because yeah, it's so the middle of the season for all of these guys. So travel days, exactly, yeah. and that's I know I've mentioned him before, but Tom Cresswell for me was just incredible. To, and I think part of you know the coaching process that people, it's actually that management between 
the, the chief physio and the head coach and him going, you've got to pull back here and me going, I need five minutes. I need to, and it, you know, that kind of negotiation of, of power as such, yeah. but what's the best as you're building because you're both doing it from the right viewpoint yeah. and the players understanding that as well. Cause these guys know their own bodies. So um, normally, normally the most successful teams have the relationship between all of those things. I call it, you know, like the, the circle of trust, you know, coach, physio, yep. S&C, um, yep. you know, sometimes the doctor, I put the doctor in that circle as well. I, I agree. So, you know, I've been fortunate. We had a guy, Matt Brown, who was Man City's doctor, who came in for the last two windows, who just, um, but I, and I absolutely agree with you. And as much as everyone had told me, until you actually go through that process and you see the impact where you, you know you get a sent you're in the, you're in the fourth quarter in a tight game and you're looking and you feel like your guys are physically absolutely at, you know yeah. ahead of you you feel you know the 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 germany game the last two minutes of the germany game in the last window okay offensively the, the last couple of minutes could we have been better yes a little bit tight a little bit nerves but I, honestly, I'm stood there going, they're not, we're a wall defensively. I don't, yeah. they just cannot score on us. I just, you know, I feel like we've got the lineups right, that the matchups right. We're, you, uh, so that that's all underpinned by that, that whole, whole process, I suppose. Absolutely carried some, um, tried to carry some stuff over because, you know, there's, it, it's not a, I think some coaches at different levels, it's an ego thing. I've ran this set, I've drawn this. It, it's not about that, it's about no. the players. No being comfortable and being consistent. And that's where I've probably been fortunate where, you know, I've been involved two and a half years. So I'd sit, you know, I'd, I'd felt like I had a good idea of some of the, you know, a lot of the players' strengths where, where they could be effective, but also things that they'd been comfortable with from, from Alberto, from Nate, things that they, you know, so I, I really, um, I, I kind of, I am proud looking back on it in terms of, the, the approach, there's, like anything, there's things that I wish I'd have done better. There's things that I wish I could have been more effective on, but there's also a lot of things that, that I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of. Um, but it, it, you know, and I know you know, but it, until you've lived that experience at sure. that level with that responsibility and you feel it, you know, you're in your yeah. environment, you feel you're it, with the national team. It, it's 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 a, just an incredible experience that, that has probably taught me more from a basketball standpoint, then I, you know, can probably articulate. So just with that point, not, not spending too much time, what do you feel you've changed, you know, from a basketball, you know, like philosophy or tactics wise that you feel like, Hey, you know, I, I wasn't even doing that three or four years ago. What do you think you, 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 you really learned to do now? Yeah, so I read um, I read a report on FIBA that uh, Scoriolo did after the the World Championships, uh, and okay, we have to understand every nation is different, and that Spain are completely different, obviously. But in terms of the the, the national team, you know, it was about he felt there might have been the most like talented types of players, but he wanted to build a team uh, it, with the national team, which I know in, in, in theory sounds straightforward, but at times that might be, you know, somebody who's going to be in a specific role in this position mm. because that's what the team needs in this environment. Sure. That, that trust and that consistency that, that you can't replicate like you can in a club season that you can in the international window. So, you know, in my mind, when a, when a player has, I don't know, he's made the right defensive, re he's rotated the right way, he's chased the guy off, the second helps there, and, and they've got that consistency, and that's happened in November. In my mind, because I've lived that experience with them, I go back to that in the February, mm. when you think about the distance and the time travel. So I, I think that consistency, less is more in, tho in those windows is absolutely everything. Uh, trying to be not trying to be being explicit on roles, you know, and, and making, making it absolutely clear on um, what the group needs to be successful because every single one of those players in that squad are a star in their own right because they wouldn't be at that level. So no. making it explicitly clear. Um, I think like, all, you know, I, I appreciate I'm jumping around a little bit. If, if I drill down into the tactical side, like always ball screen defense is going to be the coach's worst absolutely coach's worst uh, consideration when you're playing against France and 
you know, cards on the table. A lot of my experience previously had been, right, you take away the, the first threat, maybe the second threat, you'll live with the third. At this level, you, you don't live with the third or the fourth or the fifth. You know, you've got to have multiple efforts, multiple, um, yeah, multiple ideas. Um, how, gets- how, how are you um, talking to our players about defending the three-point line at this moment? So in terms of the GB team in the last window? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean... All yeah. windows, yeah. Yeah, so we did tweak it based on, on personnel, you know, stereotypically the priority against France was to guard the paint, but, you know, then Butelli is, you know, 55% three point shooter. So as much as, as much as we're talking about, this is one of our keys to the game. We have to make sure that we're there. It, it, it was run guys off. Absolutely run guys off. Right. Um, run guys off on the scout. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, I, I'm, I'm toying in my, my mind, um, you know, as with some different philosophies at this moment. Um, but one is that, you know, especially in some, you know, when you, when you're coaching against the great shooting, you know, teams is to literally, you know, you know, force this team to drive and score two, you know, not even contested twos at times, you know, yeah. you know, have them shoot yeah. a bunch of these, these kind of layup twos. In, and I'm, I'm wondering if that's, you know, because the shooting now is so incredible um, yeah. at that highest level. But anyway, that's a, that's a I, different sorry, story. Sorry, yeah. no, but you're right though. So just the, the first Montenegro game away, I felt if we could have guarded the three point line better on three occasions, we'd have won that game. Yeah. That's like it literally, that's the, the diff. And I felt that they were scout breakdowns because it, it, it was, we guarded the first part well, and then we didn't, it was Sejovic and I can, you know, in the corner, I can picture him now. So it's, you're, you're right. It's, and it's probably one of the debates that, that always has. You have your team philosophy where you try and keep wow. it extremely concise so everybody knows, but then you have to tweak that based on on, yeah. on the unpicked. Yeah, of yeah. course. So it's yeah. yeah. And I and I and I say this to teams all the time when I'm putting the scout um, you know, on the floor. You know, I can break up any of these plays. You know, I can you, you know, this is not hard for me to break to blow up this play in this spot or this spot. But then it's going to require second and third efforts from you as individuals based on our principles. And when you get when that breaks down, then we're in real trouble. You know, yep. so if you just think that we're just going to break, you know, blow up the first part of play and the play is over, then it's not basketball. So, yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, jump in very quickly because I know, you know, time and stuff. Um, very quickly, thoughts on British coaches, um, the coaching fraternity, you know, is there any thought process you have because you're very articulate. You've seen lots of things happen. You've already articulated about the BBL. Um, what do you feel? Do you feel that we're closer as a, as a co- as set of coaches now or we're still fragmented? Um, I think it varies. And, and I, I, you know, that's not a, a, like a not on the fence answer because so from my experience, I, you know, I'm really confident that I, I pick up the phone to people that I trust um, that, um, you know, I can be really objective about and look, I'm, I, and I, I've, you know, I've mentioned people on here, but look, I'm struggling with this. What would you do? Oh. Um, and I, I've always appreciated that. And I've been honest in that as well. I, I think when you sent the question through, it made me reflect and I think at times, maybe this, there's two elements of it. There is absolutely a culture in, in British basketball with coaches of, well, I wouldn't do it that way. What's that person on about? That's a joke. What does that person know? What does, I mean, I listened to Bob, Mar- you know, I'm biased with Bob, but I, I listened to him in the story he said where his assistant was in the stands and he's getting slated from, you know, you know that, that culture goes against what a fraternity is. And Tony, I, I also think social media doesn't help with that, you, you know, in terms of how you don't have to be informed to have an opinion and you don't have to have any, sub, you know, tweet, Twitter is an equalizer for substance. Yes. You don't, you, 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 you know, like you don't, and, and I, I like, I will help anybody and I'll ask people for help, you know, when I, and I don't need, I, I feel like I don't need to promote that because that's not, I did something for, I'm not going to mention the club. Somebody reached out to me a while ago and I did something with their coaches and I was chuffed. And I, I know people say it, I took more from them than I think they did from me because it should, that's what coaching is. It's coaching is a learning process. It's a, I know that I haven't spoke about it much, but like, you know, from a performance coaching background and 
you know, teaching and learning, but it's a pedagogical process. It like it absolutely, it, that's what coaching is. And it's not about, so, you know, somebody asks a question not to listen to the answer. <laughs> it, they ask a question to validate their own. And I, me and my life, I haven't got time for that. I, I don't, you know, I, I'll, I'll, so that's my own personal thing. Uh, and I'm not trying to come across harsh because I, I absolutely respect people who've got more experience, more knowledge than I have. And I'll, I listen to anybody. I'm fascinated. And, and I think I, I like listening and, and then trying to conceptualize it in my own head. But I'll also speak to certain people I trust and say, look, you know, am I on the right lines here? Am I not? Mm. And, and having that like, you know, vulnerability of saying, listen, I'm not too sure about this. And, you know, that I, we've all probably got a million and one. I remember talking to a coach once and, and this is at the very start of my journey. And I said, look, you know, I've seen a lot of three, two. I, I, I'm not too sure. I've never taught a three, two before. And the coach was like, I've never taught a three, two. And instantly my barriers have went up yeah, and I'm going like, yeah. well, we ask players to be like vulnerable and, and, and we ask players to learn. And so is there a fraternity? Great, I would say, great. I would, that's yeah. a great, great point there. Actually yeah. really great point. I would say, I would say it's siloed and it, and it, and it's, it's probably who people are with, but like coaching, like mentoring, there has to be a mutual kind of, I don't know, investment there, i.e. And I'm not, you know, i.e. you coming to Manchester to observe at under 20s and taking the time out of your day to provide feedback, mm. you know, like, and, and that's me going, yeah, I've had people in the past who've told me their opinion and I'm going, so I just, I, I think that, I think that social media doesn't help it. Mm. And I think that there are a lot of people who operate in isolation and by default they they generate ideas where maybe they're absolutely right or they don't agree and so yeah i mean I, like my personal thing is i have a lot of people that i talk with and i would i'll continue to do that i will talk with anybody i'll ask anybody for help but i just think that yeah it, it's 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 not positive on the whole is, is my my uh, gut feeling Right. Okay. That's a great, great point. Uh, let's, let's finish this off. Three, three quick questions. I'll, I'll take out the fourth one um, for a uh, uh, favorite drill that you're running at the moment. Um, so there's probably, there's probably two that, that spring to mind and I'm picturing what, uh, one at sports central, uh, essentially it's like a multiple closeout drill. Um, okay, so, nice. you know, they've got, they got to guard three closeouts and, it, but you, you structure it in a way where there's like rewards for, stops um and, and have it going at two different ends and it just becomes uber competitive for like 10 15 minutes and you know i'd, I'd always looked at closeouts in my experience being a skill that people don't teach you know don't teach the enough. most important skills at this without present time it has without always doubt. been and yeah. as i've as i've said a couple of times you know it's also the skill that I, and there aren't many, but oh well, there are actually, but um, it's also a skill that has a combination of an S and C element because, you know, acceleration to deceleration to balance is yeah. really not fully in our arsenal unless we don't have an S and C guy. Um, yeah. Then we have to learn about that. But once those guys have done that, then we have to also talk about the technical and then recovery and all of the angles, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So. And I'd like to, I like to manipulate it where it then progresses into like uh, three versus three, four versus three, because, uh, you know, again, in my experience, a lot of, I was always taught offensive decision-making. I was always taught that. Is that a good shot? Is that, and then I was always like, I hadn't been taught defensive decision-making you know, do, do I stunt here? Do I stunt and go? Or do I, okay, I need a hard close out or I need to stunt and show and slide and, you know, and, and, and yeah, so. That's great stuff. And then what's the second drill? The second one is probably, a, it's a, which I know the Northumbria lads again would probably hammer me, but it's like a transition build where I would do it at a certain point in the week and you, you play, a, you play a, a 1v1, a 2v1, a 3v2, a 4v3, 5v4, a 5v5. And then when the 5v5 starts, you start with a, a minute or two minutes on. So it's kind of situational, you, you know, you manipulate the clock a little bit, fouls, no fouls. So they're gassed, but they're also in that point, you know, looking at advantage. Is it the right one to take the defensive side? They got to scramble a little bit. They got to guard the ball in cross matchups in transition. So yeah. there's a lot going. I always felt there was a lot going on, but maybe on a, like the back end of the week where it's intense, but it's not 10 minutes up and down intense. Oh, so. That's a great, I mean, every, everyone's got their version of that odd man break drill. 
Um, yeah. You know, and actually, that's great stuff. I'm, I'm really, really happy to hear that. Uh, favorite all time basketball coach? Um, yes, I was. It made me think when you sent it through a lot. Um, I would say, I would, uh, you know, I know it's probably uh, a cliche. I, I, I couldn't not mention Bob Martin. I couldn't not mention him, you know, the impact he's had on my life. Um, and I think, you know, whether, I, I loved Greg Popovich. You know, I kind of went through a time of just being fascinated with with how he would manage the elite of the elite, i.e., you know, Tim Duncan, et cetera, and, and still hold superstars accountable and, the, you know, the, the, the pace and space, the fluidity, the continuity in offense. So, um, yeah, there's probably a lot, but, I, you know, and, and I know it's probably an easy answer, but, yeah, I oh, uh, did, awesome. really, really, yeah. And then favorite go-to saying or statement that the players are hearing, the GB players are hearing. So yeah, I think it's a favorite one. Um, I guess I think my all-time favorite one would probably be trust is built through consistency, and, and I do I do kind of believe you know you talk about kind like of trusting each other, but yeah, I spoke a lot about our mentality with the GB being an underdog, being you know the size of the the size of the fight in the dog, etc. So yeah, something along those lines. Awesome. Coach, um, listen, you know, I, I think I speak for everyone in the whole of the country. Um, wish you continued success, um, whatever, however this role manifests itself. I'm pretty certain you're going to be completely still immersed in this program. Um, good luck in the preparation and then obviously next year. Um, and I just want to thank you for, for being on the podcast today. I really appreciate it, Tony. Thanks very much. Really appreciate it.